First, thanks for in the invitation to be here. I am very excited. I am Santiago Nunes Corrales. I am a research scientist at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. And most of my work right now revolves around quantum computing. So one of the, one of the slides refers to some of our work, but mostly I've been writing APL code now for a couple of years and it's been an incredible adventure. I have to say that my first programming language when I started my undergrad was Scheme. So I come from a more trad functional tradition and I think that has some bearing on, on how I see the world in programming, but we all come from, all our backgrounds do have some contribution. So what I want to do today is have a conversation about how APL has already helped some of us in, in, in research across NCSA and mostly in the work in quantum. So it, it, it's a review of a few things, but first of all, who we are at NCSA, we deal with supercomputers, big machines that have many, many thousands or even hundreds of thousands of cores, very large memories, lots of GPUs right now for AI and a lot of work. But also we were the place that had the first usable popular web browser. So this is, this is one of the things that few people know, but it's very interesting. This thing became later Netscape. Some of the research that we do covers a many, many, many areas. For example, trying to understand the impact of an earthquake, which buildings will be most affected or which pieces of infrastructure will be, uh, will be need, will need to be taken care of in the aftermath of an event. Also trying to help farmers develop greener methods in the sense of lower carbon emissions and some, some more sophisticated things like simulating the effect of nutrient stars. And let's see, probably I'll, I'll skip the video for a moment. So one of the things that we have, we have learned through the years is that building research software is really hard. Sometimes we have researchers that come to us, they can be faculty members, they can be research scientists, and they have an idea or they have already code from their students or they have a data set. And they say, well, well what we want is to have a program that we can run sometimes in, a, in their laptops, sometimes in our supercomputers and, and, and say, well, I have a plan, but sometimes the plan doesn't follow reality quite as much as we expect. There's multiple libraries that are connected to that code. There's multiple pieces of data. They have multiple collaborators. They have multiple students that tend to write code in very different ways. And then finally, uh, there's also the idea that probably we have some technical debt as often these codes are written by graduate students and they move to continue their lives professionally while other people come in and they have to take care of that code. So it, it's a constant challenge. The other thing that we know is that more and more people in the sciences are using code to do their work. By 2010, and this is a bit of old statistics, at least 45% of scientists were spending more time than they did writing code. And at least 38 of, of those scientists spend at least one fifth of their time developing software. I know a bunch of people who were physicists or chemists and they, they've gone all the way around to just writing code and, and trying to make things work. There's a beautiful report, what's called the Atkins report saying, well, a computer works like a telescope. It is not that different from an instrument that you can use to make discoveries. And therefore, probably we need to treat them sometimes like a scientific instrument in the sense that we need to learn the rules that, that govern how they work. Now, that's not that easy. When we are dealing with scientific instruments, there's, we've been studying what it takes to, to use them. And sometimes when you build the scientific instrument, there's a lot less to know than if you write a software simulation, for example, or, or there's many more moving parts because not only do you have to understand the science, you also need to understand how computers work. And sometimes that can be a lot for people who have to write grants and who have to do all their scientific discoveries. Now, the reason software is valid and this is, I love this quote by Marvin Minsky. He said that programming is a good medium for expressing poorly understood ideas and sloppily formulated ideas. And this is great. And this is something that we have found, or at least I have found recently that APL is extremely good for. The, I, the process of crafting a scientific idea, especially when you depart from mathematics, takes a lot of time. And it takes tremendous amount of rework mostly. So what we at NCSA do, is something called research software engineering. It is an emerging discipline that recognizes that 
we are a bit of, we do a bit of programming, but we also know a bit of the science. And what we do is generate, take those scientific statements and make them into software packages. And ideally we want software packages that work. So why is it important? Well, we help people from all the disciplines not to have to learn yet another one, programming. We are also finding that sometimes, for example, with a few collaborators using APL for us, services is translation language that they can execute and that then we can take and sometimes flesh out in other languages or maybe in sometimes reuse what they, what they have done. We also want to try and generate an accurate translation between the science and the programs. And at the end of the day, our goal is to lower risk with minimal technical depth. And I also like this quote by Lawrence Peter that says that some problems are so complex, you have to be highly intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about them. And maybe interpreting here intelligence as collective intelligence, the intelligence of groups of people who do science, not just individuals or, or not just one single person. There is a lot that a language like APL brings to the, to the table. Now, writing scientific software, again, involves a lot of moving parts. And that's why we are starting to focus on something called research software prototyping. The idea is maybe you need to understand the core parts of the code and develop a software system that, that implement only the essentials to your science. You need to play with them, especially if you're a scientist or if you're assisting a scientist. Sometimes you need to allow them to, to flexibly rethink what they're doing. And that is, that is hard if you're using a language that depends, or if you're using a software context that depends on many pieces and a language that focuses more on what the computer is doing rather than the problem being solved. So we're looking at the research software engineering landscape at tools that allow us to become a pliable medium for software experimentation with reduced feature risk and cost. And that is, I think, essential for many of, of the challenges that we face in the world today. NIST has this beautiful graph indicating that, well, doing that sustainably, building research software depends on, on, on minimizing or maximizing the sustainability of code. And this goes back into general programming on, on the dependency of the cost of those bugs versus when you find them. It is easier to find the bugs where you're Defined where you're literally specifying the program or the problem rather than when you have deployed the application. And ideally, this saves time, time and money. So languages where the number of errors that you can make syntactically and semantically are the num that number is small will probably contribute to having better science in the end. Now, this in the dating table, the important point here is that. When we work with really large applications, by really large, I mean things that take days or months to run. And many, many thousands of processors, probably, uh, I apologize for the size of this, I should have planned better, but two, there's, there's a recent prize, the Gold Gordon Berg Prize is given for very large scientific applications, very large programs that solve interesting scientific questions. This one was for quantum behavior of, of materials. And basically this thing ran for one iteration of the program takes roughly two days. So making mistakes in programs this size, it's really not that affordable. So probably we want to, we want to do things with a smaller core of those programs. And we can do that because of something called locality. Locality probably has taught us that roughly for regular code, 10% of the code explains 90, 95, 90 percent of the CPU code. We have tested in our own research programs that 1% of the code roughly takes 95% of the CPU time. The rest is waiting to transfer data or there are tasks that don't have to do with the math. And I wanted to provide an example before showing some APL code to exemplify that. Let's suppose that we want to trace how the ash coming from a volcanic eruption distributes in the world and how the wind spreads that. So there's a bunch of things. There's something called Fall 3D, which is an example not managed by us at NCSA, but it is a well-known package that has many moving pieces, but the core in the, in the bottom rectangle, yellow rectangle, is this system of equations. And this is something that you have to solve. So very often what you have is something called a solver. And what is a solver? Most of the time it is an integral. It is a mathematical form that you need to understand through time and that, that, that expresses the accumulation of certain 
of certain events to give a, an overall trend. So let's, one of the things that, that I've been playing around with sometimes in the programs is just to understand how integration plays a role. And, and one of the exercises, the first exercises that allowed me to really understand the power of APL was saying, well, we have something called probability. And if we're looking at probability over something that you cannot count over something that is continuous, you need to use integrals. Like in this case, the cumulative probability density function which basically says what is the probability that something happens that has at least this value. So you need to learn how to integrate, how to compute the area under this curve. And by writing this interest, these this small APL programs, it's very easy to, to look into the structure of the problem. And lo and behold, when, when at least in the way that I wrote it, a, a general integral became an operator. And then we can connect with people in abstract mathematics that say, yes, that, that's a well-known result. We've known this for, for at least a hundred years, but to see it in code brings a different way to have that conversation. And maybe they say, no, but you're doing it too slowly or too inefficiently. Why don't we bring up a, a better rule? And then what you, end, what you end up noticing is that the only thing that you want, the only thing that changes are a few, a few lines of code. And that is beautiful and that is efficient. So why is this important? For in terms of scientific software, we want to answer a few questions. What is the shape of the problem? There was this famous writer, Jorge Luis Borges, who said that when he was writing his essays or novels, he would imagine that the words he was using had weight and that they had shape. So when he was composing his writing, he was actually imagining weighing and feeling the shape of the word and seeing if it was the right fit. Sometimes when, 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 when I've been programming in APL, it feels like that. It feels like if I am weighing the shape of the glyphs corresponding to algorithms to see which one may probably do the job best, we also want to understand how the math translates. Or maybe if we simply simplify the math, what kinds of trouble do we get into? Sometimes too much simplification may not be adequate. Another question that for us in a center is very important is how much can we parallelize? How much can we take chunks of the problem and send them to different processing units? And defense, for example, are really important in, the, in my case to understand how if computation that is more functional could perform the job. Also, we want sometimes to understand, well, can I, can I write a better algorithm for this problem? But if I have a very long program in a very strict program, or let's not say strict, but very verbose programming language, it becomes, you say, eh, it's too much cost less, and, and you reduce the number of iterations. We also want to understand performance and something very important. Have I optimized my code to run fast to the point that it has become unreadable? And curiously enough, at least in my two years experience of using APL in this domain, or at least learning APL, I am not a fully fully competent APL programmer, as many of uh, my fellow my panelists here are. But what I found is that performance is very closely tied to the form that you get at the end in your code. And this is very resounding with what Harold Abelson said. Programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. For me, going above the initial language barrier or the initial lexical barrier, the, the, the symbols and everything else, has shown that APL can do that very quickly, especially for people who are not programmers. And that is very interesting. Once they get used to the syntax, people can read it very closely to, to the mathematics, what the programs are doing. So this is something that we also want to, to favor is that prototypes are likely disposable and we want software prototypes to be like that because they are at the process of refining ideas. There's a beautiful chapter on the mythical man math, this book written by Frederick Brooks, one of the people involved in the IBM 3 system 360. And that says plan to throw one system away. And sometimes we are horrified by the fact that we've done all this work and we say, no, I have to rework it and, and it doesn't work and we have to start from scratch. APL is one of the few languages in my personal opinion that allows you to do that with relatively minimal cost. And that is tremendously powerful for making science. 
And Adam suggested in a prior conversation, this book called The Design of Design, where prototyping is central. Uh, I didn't know this book existed. I've been reading it. Fantastic piece of writing. So as part of trying to find better ways of solving problems, we humans have invented multiple families of programming languages or paradigms. And one thing that is very interesting is that APL has informed most of them because of the historical tradition that this language contains. And it means that modern implementations of APL are worth revisiting, if not to work on them on a daily basis, at least to understand and inform ourselves with the problems that people faced because some of those, these problems tend to be recurrent in the history of computing. Now, of course, we know a bit about Ken, Kenneth Iverson, the person who developed the idea of APL from his days in Harvard, then working at IBM and using IBM to specify a microprocessor. And in fact, this was the point that, that clicked for me of saying, aha, maybe because quantum computing is in very early days, maybe I can go back to the history of computing, take a page from Iverson's lessons and, and come back and see if I can learn something. It turns out we are, we are learning a lot and even things that we don't know we could learn. So for APL, it became a language and I saw a question about machine learning. There's a, I'm going to suggest a paper here by one of our or, or the colleagues in the APL community who are, who are doing that. So essentially, also in computing, we have and scientific programming, there's preferences. And of course, there were things said about APL being either a lyrical language, a language for beautiful programming, or a language that someone like Dijkstra, a very particular computer scientist said, no, I don't like it, it is not good. But at the end of the day, we, we get, we, in, in a scientific setting, we tend to guide ourselves by objective measures. And one of the objective measures is, well, what is it good for? And to those of you that are unfamiliar with it, I do recommend a notation as a tool of thought. The Turing Award lecture that Iverson gave in 1979, and he said, well, basically programming languages are ways of doing thought experiments. <clears throat> and before we move to the lab or before, be even before we write code for a scientific application, that's what we are doing, thought experiments. And basically many of these attributes that were listed in the article in 1979, ease of expressing constructs in arising problems, suggestivity, the fact that the form of the programming language will allow you to think about how the solution might look like even before you have it. The ability to subordinate details. Sometimes you don't need to see everything, but you need to access it. Economy, having short programs means having less or lower probability of bugs. And the amenability to formal proofs. It turns out that programs are an expression of any formal language can be translated to some extent to mathematical statements and also to logical statements you can say that are false or are not false to the best of our understanding. And that's important for program correctness. We have had a, a lot of trouble in science with something called computational reproducibility, the ability to get the same results qualitatively or quantitatively than other researchers with the same programs. Many of us suspect that the problem lies in this fifth point. So uh, I started looking into APL deeply, looked at many, many of, of the, <coughs> the YouTube videos and I followed a, a bunch of people and found this very interesting diagram. And many of the things that these languages can do have a strong relevance for scientific programming. Most of which, because we deal with numerical data and we need with very structured data and, and especially with machine learning on the race. The other element is, this is a, a table from Kenner Hextra paper, Hextra's paper on combinatoric logic. And it turns out that the ability to find ways to compact, to make code more compact is something that we cherish a lot in scientific programs, because then we can reveal structures of how the mathematics works that we would not see otherwise just by writing down the equations. We need to, we need to gain the intuitions by running sometimes the code. And you could say, well, but you have to learn a new, a new keyboard. Well, that's fun. That's, that's a challenge and, and, and it's enjoyable. And behind these glyphs, you know that there are algorithms. And what that does for us or has done for us is that we can, instead of writing, instead of just to get executable code, use a programming language that has a lot of 
the, you need to do a lot before you get into the real science that you want to do. With something like APL, moving into instructions and operations or having instructions that are not operations, but having instructions that are algorithms speed things up very radically. The idea of using APL for prototyping is not new. There's a beautiful paper from, I think, the 80s by Matsuki Yoshino, where he was using APL to prototype compiler writing, and it is a fascinating precedent. So there's, there's a lot more to it. So why all this pressure and why all this, or, or all this intent in doing it? to start converging into, into the final message. Imagine that this blank slide corresponds to all the scientists in the world. There's a fraction of them, <clears throat> only a fraction of them that tend to use computing to accelerate their science. There's many who are experimentalists or who have not been exposed to programming, but there's a fraction of those that do, that, have, that become really directly involved in building the scientific software in the development process. There's an even smaller fraction of those that can actually go and program specific cases, and even the smallest fraction that can build full prototypes. This is why APL, I think, presents a very compelling case for the scientific community that can help us bring more people in the face of research software engineers that we are, or at NCSA, we have founded. It, it's hard to train them. We are not many and we need more. And maybe that's also a language for us in computer science that want to become research software engineers to, to do it in, a, in, a, in an easier way. So here's, here's something that I wanted to present. It's a bit controversial and I let the audience judge it. Why is APL interesting? I think there's an equation of innovation potential is equal to apparent weirdness of what you're using multiplied by its usefulness. So think about these into axes that are orthogonal or parallel perpendicular one to each other. And suppose you want to hold a bunch of, of pens. You can use a rubber band. That's neither very weird nor very useful. You can have something that is boring but useful, a standard office pen holder. But there are objects that are weird and not really useful, like a Faber JAC. Or you can have the, the combination of all three and have this thing that looks like a Faber JAC and holds holds pens and all the things. If we think about programming languages in these dimensions, at least, again, my own views, machine language, which was suggested by Adam, it's a great example. It's not that weird. We know it exists, but it is really hard to do things with it, not really useful. Assembly, I think, crosses this threshold, but we have languages that we are more familiar with. They're not weird. They're more things we are accustomed to. And as we go along into functional programming, things get a bit more interesting. I put C++ here and again, personal, personal views, we can discuss this later. But then we, as, as more features go into a language, the harder it becomes and the less intuitive, especially for people outside of computing. And then we have things like Haskell, Camel, white space that are really not that useful. They're probably interesting languages to play with. The BQN is getting a bit more interesting. WeWa is getting a bit more interesting. Programming with pixels, really not that useful. Defunge, curious. But curiously, APL, we are starting to find, especially with GPU architectures and machine learning, that things are getting, getting really interesting at this stage in computing. So in the few minutes that I have, again, my own views, we can talk about this later. What is APL used today in forensics, the geo and geological studies, hedge funds, analyzing scientific data, data science more generally in many cases, and more recently quantum computing. So effectively, the paper I wanted to recommend was the UNET CNN in APL by Aaron Sua and Rodrigo Girao Sarao, which they show very elegantly that you can write a full, the full code for a neural network in a single page. This should be in a t-shirt, by the way, I think. This is cool enough that there's, there's ways to think about it being more, more public. For us, we started investing in, in quantum computing research about a couple of years ago. And we found that we, I started using APL to just, just to understand what quantum computing meant in terms of making a programming language. We ended up having code implemented for a library that some people are starting to use heavily in their research. So that uh, we can talk more about that. 
have, and the idea has grown to the point that we are now trying to use API to prototype what future quantum computers may look like. And we know that for traditional program programs, we can have sequencing, selection, and iteration as the main constructs. Classical computers only have space and time. We run time in a CPU and we use bytes in memory, but quantum computers have more resources. So therefore they have to be a bit, there, there must be some other things that we are not seeing. So to finalize, what have we learned? That building research software is hard. Yes, it's, it combines doing science and doing computing. We also learned that scientific packages have a core and that core maybe is the mathematical part that we need to understand really well. APL helps us explore, understand, and prototype that core. And this is a value proposition that to me <clears throat> has become much more evident as time passes. And finally, like in the case of quantum, APL code becomes your code. Thank you very much. And I am, I'll remain open for questions. <laughs>